Cool. All right. Welcome. I'm Eric Reinerson. I'm a data scientist at Instacart. And I'm here to talk to you about how we use Tableau to understand how the improvements we make to our logistics system are improving our metrics. First, a little bit about me. Um, I studied economics and math, and I've always worked on some combination of logistics, user retention, and operational efficiency. And in my most recent role, it's come back around and, uh, to my uh, economics beginnings uh, because I'm working on supply and demand economics and engineering problems in, uh, for our shopper staffing and shopper earnings teams. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit today about shopper staffing. Um, let me back up a little bit and talk about Instacart. A lot of people here are probably not ordered yet from Instacart. Uh, so the, the customer experience looks something like this. We, we partner with retailers, so the first thing you do when you open up the app is you select a retailer, as if you were walking into that store. So you select your favorite retailer. We have hundreds of partners, so hopefully your favorite is on there. And then you would find all your groceries and uh, fill up your cart, go ahead and place an order. And then, this part's really important for today's talk, you would select when you want the delivery. One thing that Instacart is mostly used for by people is getting deliveries very quickly. So most orders are placed for today. Uh, and if it's the evening, they're typically placed for the next morning. Um, you can order within one or two hours, or you can take a one hour slot uh, when, when you'd like it later. And then lastly, you would communicate with your shopper throughout the delivery if there was any replacements or refunds. And if you're really obsessed, you could actually watch them inching along a map real time while the delivery is brought to you. It's pretty fun. So that's the customer experience. We also have a shopper app because our shoppers, in addition to doing things like needing to pick up shifts and, and make changes to their schedule, while they're actually working, of course, they've got their own app. So the shopper side looks something like this while they're on shift. So they would see an order and they would accept it, hopefully, and they would pick up all the items, um, probably communicating with the customer if they had to make any replacements or, or if something wasn't available. Um, and uh, if, if something was not available, they would, uh, if possibly the customer would have selected a replacement as part of the checkout process. If not, we have machine learning models that will make recommendations to the shopper about what would be a good replacement based on, uh, based on all of our catalog data and also what we know about that customer's purchases. And then uh, this, <laughs> this might seem like a small detail, but if you've ever shopped for somebody else, even your own spouse, you'd be surprised how many things in a grocery store you've never heard of or can't tell the difference between. So for example, in this case, you picked up uh, total 2% with strawberry low-fat Greek strained yogurt, and you had no idea that actually it looks really similar, but it's 3% unstrained low-fat Greek yogurt, and the customer doesn't want that. So the, bar, the barcode scanner has caught many a mistake, including my own when I've, when I've done shopping for, for customers. And then lastly, uh, we, we actually would have notified the customer in real time while replacements are being made to let them approve or, or make, uh, make some comments to the shopper. But at the end, we would prompt the shopper to review any changes that they made, because this is one of the big quality levers for us, is making good replacements and only making refunds if we really can't find a good replacement. And then you would, next step would be the delivery process that we looked at earlier. Uh, so we've got 50,000 shoppers right now. We, we deliver from thousands of locations. We've got over 100 retail partners. And our, our catalog, we have a whole catalog team working on uh, keeping the prices and availability updated for over a million items. We're building the world's largest grocery catalog in, uh, to, um, in order to have good information for our customers about what they're ordering. You know, a lot of things have nutrition facts. Um, hope, certainly the pricing and availability needs to be accurate. The availability can differ from store location to store location, which can be factored into what we show somebody when they're ordering based on where, they, where it would probably come from. So that's a little bit about Instacart. I'm going to talk the rest of today about logistics, because that's the team that I've worked in for the whole time I've been in Instacart. And then I'll zoom in on shopper staffing in a minute. So our logistics system is basically about everything involving getting items from the shelf to a customer's door. So on the same day, a lot of those problems look like uh, the screens that I talked about earlier and how we, how we make that process smooth for customers and for shoppers. On the delivery side, uh, to give you a sense of, of the kind of density we've got, this is, actually, this is actually not a map of San Francisco, nor is that a map of Austin, Boston, or Miami. This is made with just GPS location data from shoppers doing deliveries during the week. Um, so it looks like a map because we actually we have a lot of uh, <laughs> we do a lot of deliveries. My favorite part of this map, I was looking at it this morning, uh, is actually all the all the paths through Golden Gate Park. I like to imagine people uh, arriving at the meadow with their picnic blanket and having the groceries show up just in time uh, for their for their picnic. Um, so, but that's the delivery end. So, to, in order to actually get to doing a delivery, we have to have shoppers, and we have to have them on on shift. So, I'm going to talk more about the shopper staffing team and the work that we do. So there's three main areas that our systems fall into. So the first thing we need to do is figure out how much demand we're going to have. 
And there's two pieces to demand. Um, one of them is the deliveries that we did. You can figure out how many deliveries we did by just running a SQL query. The harder thing is figuring out how many deliveries could we have done if we had good availability. Because I showed earlier a really nice screen where you can have delivery anytime you want it. But sometimes we're busy and we can't deliver every single time that you want it. So if we don't have great, great, uh, great options as far as getting Instacart whenever you want, some people won't order. So we actually have a model that estimates that. I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. So you take the lost deliveries and the actual deliveries and add them together and you get demand. And once you have demand, now you can actually make a scientific forecast because you have the metric that you want. So uh, we, we, we take demand forecast and then we figure out, I'm going to skip a lot of detail here, based on the demand that we have, how many shoppers do we need, when and where in order to meet that demand. And for those of you who are taking pictures, there's actually a blog post that I, I borrowed these, images, these three images from. So, uh, if, your if you can't read it on your phone, you could always go to the blog. Um, so then lastly, uh, so, th so the shopper hours are one thing. The other side of, of this is how many shoppers, shopper hours is how many shoppers do we need in the next two weeks. Shopper, um, for the next uh, six weeks or, or two months, we actually need to know how many shoppers we need to hire because the longer the time frame, the more we can change the amount of shoppers that we have. So when we think about the next couple months, we're backing that into how many applicants do we need applying to Instacart to become shoppers. Um, so, then, so then lastly, once you get close to the shift uh, and close to the delivery window, and I'm talking like you know, a couple hours, at that point, we've got a couple levers. One I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more in context, which is uh, scaling, which is, is, is trying to get more or less shoppers at the last minute. And then another one is, uh, is uh, the capacity model. So the capacity model, if we start getting a lot more orders than we can handle, instead of delivering orders late, which nobody, nobody likes, that's, that's something we really don't like doing is delivering late, uh, we actually just turn off delivery windows. So maybe you would see some windows open and some windows closed. And then to avoid even doing that, we also have some amount of busy pricing, kind of like you guys are familiar with surge pricing from Uber. We have something similar. So those are our systems. I'm actually going to focus uh, at a high level on how these two metrics relate. So everything that you just saw feeds into these two metrics, which is utilization, which is how busy the shoppers are, and availability, which is to what degree are our delivery windows open. And availability is really important because if you think about what somebody is looking for when they come to Instacart, maybe they want delivery between 2 and 3 PM, and they just can't have it. Or maybe it's between 4 and 5, and, and busy pricing is unattractive. And so they might just order from 3 to 4, hopefully. Or they might say, you know what? That's not what I want. I'm going to either go to the grocery store myself, or I'm going to find some other way to meet my need. And so we, we think about, I mentioned the, the lost delivery model. So a, a, a customer coming to the site might check out, which is great. Or they might say, I'm not going to check out because I don't like the delivery options that I see. Or they might not check out for some other reason. They were just kind of curious if we, uh, if we carried some particular items. Um, so at this point, we don't actually know why somebody didn't check out. So we have a model that estimates this in aggregate. And we, have, we know that it's pretty good because we actually have a, an experimental holdout. So we, we know we roughly have the right quantity of people that didn't check out because of availability. But on an individual basis, we don't know this. Um, but we have a pretty good model of it, which allows us to model demand at a, uh, for forecasts. So I want to talk about how utilization and, and uh, availability affect our, our, um, affect our bottom line, I guess, I should say. So if demand is higher than supply, we have lost deliveries. Customers can't get Instacart. And so they, they leave. And if, they, if, we do, if we do this to them often enough, they might just stop using Instacart and not even check anymore. So there's a short-term repercussion of we missed the chance to do a delivery. There's a long-term repercussion of you know, do it a few times, and, and you might have lost all the future deliveries. So uh, on, the, on the other side, if, if we have too much supply and not of demand, we have shoppers being idle. And shoppers being idle is bad because you know, time is money, and some money is wasted when people are just standing around. Nobody's happy about that. So we'd like to hit this perfect balance. But of course, uh, demand, demand forecasts have some amount of error. You know, we make the demand forecast days and days in advance. And we update it every day, getting closer. But it's mostly based on you know, what happened last week and the week before that and whatnot. We're, it's, it's primarily a time series forecast. So uh, you know, it's got some error. Sometimes we're wrong. And similarly, uh, you know, the amount of time it takes a shopper to do a delivery can change based on things like traffic. So there's, we're definitely falling on either, either end of this perfect balance at any given time. So we think about, we think about this trade-off where um, without doing anything smart, we can just staff more or less relative, relative to demand. So this is the efficiency frontier. And this is the concept I've been building up to here. And we're going to talk about the efficiency frontier for the rest of this talk. 
So tight staffing, so, so this curve at the bottom here, let's say this is where we're at. With the systems that we have in the, in the city that we're in, with the density of deliveries that we have, we can either uh, end up here. So we have poor availability, but we've got great utilization, so the shoppers are busy and they're, they're doing orders back to back. Or, again, without doing anything, anything fancy, we can just staff more aggressively relative to demand, and we can make sure that we have great availability for customers, but that means that shoppers aren't as busy, so the utilization isn't as good. So the fact that there's this trade-off means that uh, we have this sort of curve that we live on called the efficiency frontier. So there's different kinds of projects that we do in shopper staffing. One kind of project is about making sure we hit the right place on this frontier. And uh, you know, while these are equally attainable, they're not equally preferable because, uh, as I mentioned, we've got, a we've got idleness, which has a cost, which is fairly easy to calculate um, because you can figure what, what are shoppers supposed to be making and therefore what is the cost of the time that they're not spending doing deliveries. This one's a lot harder because it's not just about what's, what, did, what did we lose with the delivery. Um, because, because there's this future impact on customer retention and customer engagement, to really put a dollar value on this, you have to think about like, what is our margin gonna, structure going to look like three years from now? What's the competitive landscape look like now? And what's it going to look like in the future? So it's hard to put an exact dollar value on this, but we have to make decisions. So we've got a rough sense of this that we use for, for this purpose. And then we've got a sense of this. And so that allows us to actually pick pick a spot on this frontier. So the, where, the, the ratio of those costs helps us figure out you know, if this is the ratio, if for those of you who took economics, this sounds a lot like indif indifference curves. It's kind of the same idea. Um, so this is our cost ratio. You know, the optimal point is somewhere you know, right here, let's say. So if we're ending up down here, because there's some problem in our system, even just getting here is actually better for us economically. But if we're really smart, we do something that moves the curve, and then it's just a win-win. So I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about how we, how we look at this. So first of all, we actually have a, da a Tableau dashboard that shows this. And this is a lot of fun because you know, if, you, if you are from the social sciences, there's a lot of cool theories that make nice graphs, and it's really hard to find data that's <laughs> that fits those graphs. It's not, it's not often that you actually get to see a nice, clean, relatively clean relationship. So this is for one particular city over a two and a half week period. Every dot is a particular day. And at the bottom here, we've got the availability. And up here, we've got the on-shift utilization. So, as I mentioned, we've got error from the demand forecast. We've got error in terms of what our expected shopper efficiency is. We have error in terms of um, we have error in terms of uh, how many shoppers maybe show up to the shift or don't show up to the shift or show up late. So we're definitely there's definitely some noise here, but you can get a sense that we're on some kind of frontier. That if we do something smart, maybe we can move that frontier out, or maybe we can do something to control control the noise and end up in the right spot. Uh, anything else I wanted to say about that? Nope. So this is just to give a quick view of the actual dashboard. So we have an efficiency frontier dashboard. It looks a lot messier because all kinds of cities are on there. Uh, I'll filter down for a couple cities in a minute. So we can filter for things like, you can look at it by zone, which is more or less a city. You can look at it by region, which is a higher aggregation. You can also filter it for zones that have more or less deliveries because, as it turns out, the trade-off is a lot more favorable if you have more uh, delivery density. And then the, fun, the really fun part is you can actually forecast for the, uh, sorry, you can actually filter for the forecast error. So the filter up there, if you move that down, you get a lot less noise because you're actually seeing uh, the efficiency frontier when our forecast isn't way off. Uh, and there's the fill gap is something similar. So uh, I mentioned the fact that the trade-off is more favorable in a more dense city. This is part of why growth is so important to us. If you, um, to, to take an extreme, really oversimplified example, let's say you've got one shopper in a city. That shopper is either 100% utilized or they're 0% utilized at any given time because they're either working on a batch or they're waiting for the next batch. And if they're 100% utilized, it's, we can't really take another order in for right now because they're busy um, without, without uh, not knowing exactly when they're going to be able to deliver it. So in that, in that very oversimplified example, let's say, the, let's say the middle of that efficiency frontier is 50% utilization and 50% availability. Well, that's terrible. We can't build a business around that. Um, once you have 100 shoppers or 150 shoppers on shift, at any given time, even if you're at 95% utilization, at any given time, several people are free, so you can keep taking orders in. So what we see is, here's a smaller, much smaller city, and there's a much bigger city uh, that I filtered for here. And so they're just on a different efficiency frontier. Um, so it's important to look at one city at a time when you, when you look at this, because you see a lot, a, lot cleaner, uh, a lot cleaner story. So as far as what, what this dashboard is for, I want to talk a little bit about how we're organized, because it'll help, help you imagine what, who, who would use this dashboard and why. So we're our, our engineering team 
is organized around product, what we call product team. And a product team um, is responsible for a set of uh, features or a set of screens or something that um, encapsulates some part of the customer or shopper experience or maybe some kind of infrastructure behind that. So the shopper staffing team is responsible for the metrics that I talked about, plus the shopper experience of getting on shift and uh, picking, trying to get, we actually have a new product called a pickup waitlist. So if you're not on shift and you want to get on shift and all, all the shifts are taken, you can sign up for the waitlist. So we make decisions like, what should that look like getting on to the pickup waitlist? How should we prioritize people? Should it be first in, first out? So we have kind of strategic decisions and design decisions. And so the shopper staffing team is responsible for all, everything relating to those metrics and all, all, of the, all of the sort of staffing related shopper experience and all of the, the supply and demand uh, systems that I talked about. Um, so we have one data scientist, we've got a couple, two or three machine learning engineers, we've got a handful of software engineers, we've got mobile engineers, user researchers, designers, and then a product manager or two. Um, and so basically anybody from, that, anybody from that list is probably working on moving one of those metrics, and if they can manage to move both of them, of course, that's the efficiency frontier shift that we talked about. So anybody doing any of those things is responsible ultimately for moving the metric, and so those are all the people who might be looking at this dashboard and saying, okay, I just rolled out this change, or I'm running a test in this city, and I want to see the uh, availability get better, or I want to see the utilization get better. So that's the dashboard audience. Um, that what I described in terms of team structure, same thing for, I'm also on the shopper earnings team, so we figure out structurally what are, what's the right structure for paying shoppers um, in terms of what incentives there are. Same thing, you've got a similar list of people. So we organize around, organize around a set of uh, screens and experiences, and we're all ultimately trying to move metrics. If you look at our quarterly goals, they start with company metric, team metric, and then it goes down to projects that people, people would actually own that are trying to move those metrics. And so that's the way they would use the dashboard. Uh, and we've got, we're actually a big, we use Tableau all over the place. So this is just one of many dashboards in, in, the particular, in that particular team. Every team's got a, a handful of dashboards like this. So this is the really fun part. I'm gonna talk to you guys about a couple specific projects and what they looked like on the efficiency frontier, both what we thought they would look like and, and what they actually looked like. I'm gonna start with real-time staffing. So I mentioned the demand forecast, and since it's used for staffing, and we staff uh, up, to, up to almost two weeks out, um, it's primarily based on the past, and so by the, you know, the, the, the forecast for that morning, for that day, it's still based on the past because most people haven't placed an order yet for that day. Most people are, we don't have, some, some companies that do deliveries run algorithms all night trying to find the optimal delivery path because you can't place same day orders. We can't do that. We, have to, we actually have to update our delivery paths and, uh, and, and our, uh, our batching algorithm every minute or something because we're constantly getting new orders in. We're constantly having shoppers get on shift or, or get off shift. Um, and so, We've always had the ability to add or, or, sub, add or uh, subtract shoppers from the shift on relatively short notice. I'll, I'll talk about what that looks like. But what's new is uh, we actually implemented something called real-time staffing. And real-time staffing is two things. It's, it's the existing scaling system with uh, a better forecast that's based on same-day signals. So maybe one, two, three hours in advance, we're saying, okay, now we've actually got a whole lot of orders in. We can compare the trajectory of orders piling up to what it would normally look like and say, with a lot more confidence, you know, if this is our error bar, this is our margin of error around the, um, around the demand forecast, now the margin of error is here, and it might be significantly higher or lower than we thought it was by the time, by the time we're a couple hours out. So now that we actually have a better sense of that, we can take our scaling tools, which in the past we would have used for, uh, you know, once, once the hour actually starts, we're seeing delivery windows closing, and so we're asking shoppers, hey, uh, we're super busy right now, do you think you can extend your shift by an hour or two? Or we're finding that actually shoppers are really poorly utilized right now. And so we're like, hey, really sorry. Uh, do you think you could, like, if, if you're interested in leaving early, now's a good time because we're just not as busy as we expected. So we've always had these systems, but it's always kind of last minute. And so what real-time staffing has allowed us to do through the real-time forecast is make these very confident assessments of where we're going to be several hours from now. And so now we can use these tools a lot more intelligently and also uh, with more advanced notice, and the more advanced notice you have, the more you can change uh, the, the schedule, the more you can change the number of shoppers on shift. Because we prefer not to do this in general, um, you know, shoppers sign up expecting some baseline level of, of utilization, so scaling up and scaling down are better than not doing those things if we're sure about what the scenario is. Um, but we don't do them unless we're pretty sure. So the way to think about that is we've got our new margin of error for the demand forecast. If the demand that we're staffed for is outside of that margin of error, we'll scale up or we'll scale down. Because we're sort of cautious about that, we can be pretty confident that if we're, if we're downscaling 
anybody who decides, yeah, you know what, I am going to take off, uh, they're actually just being taken right out of the idle totals without affecting the availability because we have too many shoppers, so availability is not a concern. Similarly, if we're adding shoppers to the shift and we're doing it only when the demand, demand is um, outside of that margin of error, for the, or the demand that we're staffed for is outside of the margin of error for that forecast, we can be pretty confident that that is just going to pick up more and more capacity and reopen windows, and the utilization is going to stay very high. So what we expect to see, here's the city that we rolled this out in, what we expect to see is for this to move. Um, and you might be wondering, gosh, don't you do an A-B test for a big change like that? And we do, but because availability is a customer metric and utilization is a shopper metric that are both affected by the entire system, you can't just like pick people and include them in, an, in the A or the B part of the test because it's a really a system level metric. Um, I would encourage you to go to our blog. We actually talk a little bit about how we do city level A-B tests. Um, it's pretty neat the, how we do it statistically and how we set it up. So suffice it to say, we did an A-B test. For simplicity, I'm just going to show you what happened when we actually rolled this out. So this is the week before the rollout in the city that we, we first rolled this out in, or one of the first cities we rolled it out in. So hooray, we actually saw that we got better utilization, quite a bit better utilization, and somewhat either the same or somewhat better availability. So this is the change that we want to get. This is my favorite kind of uh, project. So that's exciting. Uh, so we actually moved the efficiency front here. Hopefully that makes sense. I'll, I'll pause there for you guys to think about it. Um, and now I'm going to talk about one more change that actually was slightly different, which is to the cancellation forecast. So just like uh, airlines know that not everyone's going to show up to the flight, so they overbook it a little bit. Usually that's OK. Sometimes they have to give you a bonus for, for being bumped. Um, similarly, you know, we know if we want, in this case, in, in my, my um, graphic here, let's say we want eight shoppers. We know that it, in this case, let's assume that 30% cancellation. We need to staff 10 in order to end up with, um, in, a, in order to end up with eight. So, but let's say actually our forecast was that we would lose three instead of losing two. Uh, we actually discovered a couple months ago that our cancellation forecast was biased. And so what that meant was, you know, there's always going to be error, but if your error is usually on one side or the other, in our case, we were finding that we were consistently ending up with more shoppers on shift than we wanted, which meant, you know, great for customers, but uh, the utilization wasn't as good. And as I mentioned, we put a lot of thought into where in that trade-off we want to be. And so we're not in the right place on the efficiency frontier. So we, we fixed the bug. And then, and actually, for fun, this is actually the same city. So we started here, and then this was one week, and then the next week we rolled out real-time staffing. So then we fixed the bug uh, once we found it in the uh, cancellation forecast. So this is week one, this is week two. And in week three, you can see we didn't move the efficiency frontier. We, we haven't fundamentally changed the trade-off between availability and utilization. But now we're where we want to be. We wanted to have higher utilization, and we're OK with slightly lower uh, availability. So, this allowed us to hit where we want to be on the efficiency frontier. So that's about all the time that we have. Um, I would encourage you to check out the blog. There's some more stories about other systems. Um, it's tech.instacart.com. And uh, there's, a, there's a survey um, about the session, so don't forget to fill out your survey. And then lastly, if you guys have any questions, I'll be around, but also I'd love to hear from you. I'm Eric, E-R-I-C, at instacart.com. Um, if you want to hear more about this, or if any of you would love to join us solving problems like this. This is just a thin sliver of the problems, the data-driven problems we're working on in Instacart. We're hiring like 240 people in, in engineering and data-driven roles this, this year. So that could be you, and I'd, I'd love to work with you if, it, if you'd like it to be. Um, yeah, so send me a note.